We have one of my best friends and uh, probably in the top five most honorable men. Um, uh, I'm seeing to see if he'll give me some, you know, if he'll give me some cash and I'll make him the number one most honorable <laughs> man I know. Uh, but uh, David Barton is one of the most honorable men I know and um, a, uh, one of the best Christians I know. One of the, uh, you're, you're my hero. Thanks, you're bro. my hero. Thanks. Um, and we were on a plane. Were we coming back from the Middle East when we had this conversation? We were. So we were coming back from Jerusalem, and David and I, uh, nobody, everybody else was sleeping, and David and I were, t were talking, you know, it's like 3 o'clock in the morning, and we're like, yeah, will you know another thing? And, uh, and uh, I said something about the Koran, mm -hmm. and um, I don't remember how it was, that, that, that Barack Obama, I think, had said that um, the... Uh, uh, that uh, Islam had played a great role at the founding mm -hmm. of our nation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, David, I, I wasn't aware of that. Mm -hmm. We have it? Watch this, watch this, watch this. Wait, wait, wait till you hear it. It's a reminder that Islam has always been a part of America. The first Muslim ambassador to the United States from Tunisia was hosted by President Jefferson, who arranged a sunset dinner for his guest because it was Ramadan, making it the first known iftar at the White House more than 200 years ago. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. This is okay. So that was a, that was a special moment. It was a, sun, it was a sunset cruise. <laughs> a sunset and they cruise held hands, hands <laughs> and it was so beautiful. By the way, David Barton, in case you don't know for some reason, David is the founder and president of wallbuilders.com. And I ask you if you, if I ask you to put your money where your heart is. Wallbuilders.com does more good than a, a, a pack of charities combined. All right, so David, go ahead. Come right. on. Let's Go. take this thing because what's happening now, and you, you cover the Muslim Brotherhood, what's happening is a historic organization that goes back a long time, uh -huh. and they're really trying to get a foothold in America and make us think that they're mainstream and normal. And so part, part of what you get is the president saying that. Uh, I was talking to, we have a radio program, General Jerry Boykin was just on it, and he's the guy who ran Delta and everything. He says so far, in, in just the last few years, we have 27 judges who have used Sharia law in 23 states for court decisions. So Sharia law is already in fact, so people of Oklahoma vote and they say, we don't want Sharia law, and of course, that gets taken to court, and the judge says, yeah, you, you can't have a, an amendment that says you don't want Sharia law. So this thing is really creeping in. Um, Obama's one, got, got another clip to show you. Now, Jefferson, everybody keeps try, try, trying to tie to Jefferson. You know, you, mm -hmm. you get Jefferson's out there, and so Obama says Jefferson did the first Eftar dinner. Let me take you back to another reference to Jefferson, and it deals with Keith Ellison. Keith Ellison is the first modern Muslim elected to Congress back in 2007. And, and you'll see a picture here uh, of Keith Ellison, and he's got his hand on a Koran being sworn in. It hadn't happened before in America, so he's being sworn on this Koran. And in being sworn in on this Koran, and you see a close up of here, you, you can see on the back what it says, it's Jefferson's Koran. It's from 1746. And, and so uh, the, we got a quote from, uh, a, a great quote here from, from Ellison. Let me show you this quote we got. There he is. See, there, there's there, and see his hand on it. And so you see a close-up of it. Look, Look at, at Nancy it. Pelosi right after plastic surgery. Here's what he says. The Koran is definitely an important historical document in our national history, and it demonstrates that Jefferson was a broad visionary thinker. It would have been something that contributed, it, the Koran would have been something that contributed to his own thinking. You know what? I agree with that. I say we take that from, uh, from Keith Ellison. I agree with every word of that. I do. It, it, you I do. do. I, do. I, do. I, I totally agree. Just not the way he meant it. Yeah. It's totally opposite of what he meant. Right. Because w when you take those two things and put them together, how does Jefferson get tagged with this, this Koran thing? Has, why are they using him to justify what's happening with Islam in the United States? And that's where you've got to go back, um, because we've had what we're doing right now at the military is really America's second war on terror. The first war on terror we had lasted 32 years, went through four different presidencies and the Continental Congress. So you have to go back to where did we get involved in our first war against Islamic terrorism and radical Islam? You have to go back to the end of the American Revolution. 1783, we signed the peace treaty. We've been up to our ears fighting the British and haven't had time to see anything else. But overseas, we've been attacked by Islam. And so what happened was these three guys you see here, these are the first three ambassadors sent by the Continental Congress to negotiate 
with Muslim extremists in Europe. So you've got Jefferson, you've got Franklin, you've got Adams. These three guys are sent to Europe. And at this point, we don't have a Navy. The French were our, were our Navy. You know, we had the British Navy. Now we separated from the, So these guys are trying to go settle things. And what's really interesting is after these guys have been in Europe for two years negotiating with Muslim extremists, Adams and Jefferson get out with the Triple N ambassador and they said, you know, we've kind of developed a relationship of trust here. We don't understand. Why do you keep attacking America? We haven't done a thing to you. We, we've come after you in no way. We've created no offense for you. Why in the heck do you keep attacking? Because everywhere we've sent an American ship that had an American flag on it, these guys are going after it. They're, they're hitting Americans. Uh, they're, they're capturing Americans. They found they could hold them as slaves. Then they found they could sell them. They would get about a million dollars a ship for ransoming the, the captain. And, and so Jefferson and Adams say, what's up with this? Look at the answer uh, of the ambassador. Here's his explanation of why all these unprovoked attacks against America. This is what he said. The ambassador answered us that it was founded on the laws of their prophet Muhammad, that it was written in their Quran that all nations who should not have acknowledged their authority were sinners. It was their right and their duty to make war on them wherever they could be found and to make slaves of all they could take as prisoners, and that every Muslim who should be slain in battle was sure to go to paradise. So, Jefferson... Can you, believe, can you, say, you ever learn this... <laughs> you took he one. Where'd you learn that? I'm, I've been studying it with, uh, I'm involved with the uh, War of 1812 group. Okay. Yeah, and, yeah uh, that'll do it. Okay, yeah. In six frigates. Uh, that's that's right. where it right. all came from. So, I mean, yeah. I mean, if you, I mean, but nobody else knows this. Yeah. Uh, you know how I learned this? I first stumbled onto this on there is a, there is a um, uh, monument that was in front of the Capitol. You probably yeah. know this. And it was moved to Annapolis. <laughs> And it, I mean, it's this big pillar, and it's sitting there in Annapolis. It's this big, white, old pillar. Have you seen it, David? Yes, you know what I'm talking about? I have. And it has heads of Muslims all the way around it. I mean, it's the most shocking, politically incorrect thing. And I'm like, whoa, what is that? Mm -hmm. You look it up, and you start to find this history, and it just unravels yeah, on you. It does. And, and it's and facing the same thing that they were facing. It's, it's, and, and Notice the motivation. Why are you attacking us? Well, our prophet requires that we do it. The Quran says we have to do it. We're told in the Quran we have to attack you. We have to make you slaves and subjugate you to us. And we're told that if we do that and we get killed doing it, we're going to heaven. Okay, but did they eschew violence? Did they? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, that comes later in the story. Yeah, okay, I, yeah, I, got, right. I got some more coming okay, on that. Okay, good. All right, we're going to come back with uh, the rest of the story. And, and, uh, and you're just going to... You are going to you're going to, you're going to take GBTV tonight, and you're just going to hug it, and you're going to go. That is such a nice fact that I can't wait to spring on some pinhead. Thanks to <laughs> David Barton. Back in just a second. All right. And we're going to take some questions from this amazing audience today, and uh, next week we have. Um, uh, I got some things. I got some questions for the Occupy Wall Street people. Uh, lots of them. It might take me about four shows to get through them all. Um, and we have some professors. We have the professors coming in next week. Tuesday. Um, and the professors are going to teach not only college students, but also you how to defend capitalism. Um, but tonight, David Barton is here. And um, tell me about. Tell me about uh, the rest of the story here. So what happens is you, you get this answer that says, hey, we're required to do this about the Koran. And it's like these guys go, wait a minute. There's a religious book that says you go to heaven for killing people and going to war against people. And they go, nah. And so Jefferson says, I've got to read this for myself. Well, there's your first introduction to the Koran. Jefferson wants to see for himself if there really is such a wacky position that you go to heaven for killing people and creating war. And so that's, that's the first exposure. Against. Now, we'll come back to that later because he's not president yet. So all this is going on. We don't have a navy. We don't have an army. We abs Founding fathers absolutely deplore a standing army. They don't want a permanent military. They, they condemned that in the Declaration. They did not allow that in, in the Constitution. They didn't forbid it, but they didn't establish it. Now we go to George Washington being president. The only way we've been able to find to keep these guys from attacking us is we have to bribe them. If we pay them millions upon millions, then they will. So it's extortion. We're, we're in a serious blackmail. By the time you get to the seventh year of Washington's eight years, in his seventh year, Washington is now paying 16% of the entire federal budget to keep these guys from attacking us. So one-sixth of the amazing. federal budget. One-sixth of the federal budget is going to keep 
Islamic extremists from attacking us. This is where Washington's had it, because he's a military guy. He likes to fight. He, he's already won battles. He's been a guy all of his life fighting battles. Look what he says uh, about, he just, he's fed up with these terrorists. This is, this is the quote that he uses. He said, would to heaven we had a Navy able to reform those enemies to mankind or to crush them into non-existence. I wish I had some means to go over there and thump them. That's the first time he goes before Congress and says, okay, we need to change our position on a standing army because we always thought we'd get attacked here, and if we did, all the farmers go home and get their squirrel guns, we'd fight off the British again. We didn't think about having to defend America overseas. No president right now would say that. that that's right. No president right now would say that. But see, that's what he was. Mm -hmm. And that's why they didn't want a standing army. Now they have to reconsider. So he says, appropriate money, let me build a navy. Congress, and now, here's his policy. Here's why he wanted a navy. This, this is what Washington said. He said, to be prepared for war is one of the most effectual means of preserving peace. If we want to end this war, we've got to be able to fight a war, and we can't do it. So, so Congress, that, that's exactly right, strength. So Congress appropriates the money. They give him, but he's out of office. So now John Adams comes in as president. John Adams comes in. It is John Adams who builds the Navy. John Adams is known as the father of the American Navy. He's got a Navy. Let's go end this thing. He does not end it. Why not end it? John Adams, who's first diplomat, he, now he's done this for 15 years, vice president under, under Washington. He says, I know these guys. He said, if we get involved in a conflict with them, he said, it's going to last forever. He says, I don't think the American people have the stomach to take on Islamic terrorism because it'll last a long time. This is not a quick fight like the British. So he refused to do that. Now, at the time he went out of office, we're now up to 20 percent of the federal budget being spent to pay off these guys to keep them from attacking us, and that's not even working all the time. They're, they're still attacking us. So now we come to Jefferson. Jefferson, the president, goes in. Jefferson goes in, and he says, I've had it. I'm not going to pay. And by the way, we were already having tax protests then because we're paying so much of our taxes to pay off these terrorists that it's costing Americans. And so you're getting tax protests over this the fact that we're not fighting, we're paying extortion money. Jefferson says, I'm not paying any more bribes. At that point, two of the Islamic nations declared war on the United States. First official war declared against us as an independent nation was when we stopped paying tribute and stopped negotiating and stopped playing around with extortion money. Uh, and, and so Tripoli declared war and Algiers went to the point of declaring war. So we got two declaring war. And he says, who cares? And so he takes this brand new navy he's got and he ships this navy overseas because there's four nations going after us, actually five. When we started shipping the Navy, three of them backed off and then four backed off and so we only had Tripoli to deal with. And so you see the American Navy sailing over a brand new Navy, first time we've had our own Navy. They get there and there's, there's some cool pictures here. You'll see a picture of, of the fighting that's going on. It was hand-to-hand -hand combat, close quarters, the same kind of thing. See, here's the Navy sailing out. They're headed over to North Africa, to Tripoli specifically, and here's the type of battles you see going on. And so this is Stephen Decatur, a young lieutenant who, who's there engaged in all this battle. And so this is fighting to keep them from attacking Americans because they're, they're having their way with everything going on. This is young Stephen Decatur. So at this point, Jefferson puts military troops on the ground for five years over there. That's where we get our Marine Corps hymn. Our Marine Corps hymn says from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. That's the first war on terror. The first time we had to fight Islamic extremists, and that's the Marine Corps hymn. Paul Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. Now, this thing is over in 1805. So now we come back home. We've got a time of peace, if you will. And in 1806, this is printed. Now, this is the first Koran printed in the United States. This is 1806. Is it printed? Jefferson is our president here. And here's the uh, first American edition. The Koran says right here. Now, interesting thing. Why, why print a Koran? Because we've been fighting these guys for five years, and people are going, what in the heck are these guys thinking? Well, if you want to know what they're thinking, let's, let's read their book. So here we come out with the... i got to read you the introduction. This is... <laughs> You're going to love this. Here's the editor's introduction. And it says, this is a book. This book is a long conference between God, the angels, Muhammad, and on through it goes. Set it up. When you get done with this book, this is what it says. You'll find, he says, you'll wonder that such absurdities have infected the best part of the world. They're saying, you will not believe what these guys believe. When you read this book, you won't believe the, insert, uh, the absurdities that have infected that much of the world. And you will uh, uh, vouch that the knowledge of what is contained in this book will render that law contemptible. If you read this, you will have contempt for Islamic law. And, and that's why they put this out, because we've just gone through five years 
of fighting these guys, and we need the American people to know what this is all about because we didn't start this. They're the one, and, and they said it's in our Koran. We do this because it's in our book. We're only doing what our book tells us, and so Americans needed to know what the book said. So that's where you get it. What, what happened after that? Well, what happened after that was we had a period of peace, and that period of peace lasted, and then you come to James Madison as president, and James Madison gets involved in the War of 1812. And so the War of 1812, we're fighting the British. And don't ever think that foreign nations don't watch what's happening with our domestic policy. We were all tied up fighting the British. Our Navy's tied up. Here's Perry and Lake Erie, the battle. We're all tied up fighting the British. Islamic extremists say, hey, we can attack again because their Navy is all tied up. So they start whacking American interest again. And Madison couldn't do a thing about it because we couldn't carry on a war on two fronts. We could only carry on one front. But as soon as that war was, that treaty was signed, 1815, John Quincy Adams negotiated the treaty. Madison loads up the Navy again and sends them back overseas. Now that young lieutenant, Stephen Decatur, is now made the commander, taking the Navy and the Marines back overseas. And for two, two years, they thump Algiers, and they just beat their brains in. And after two years of that, and here's some more of that hand-to-hand -hand combat that you see Stephen Decatur again leading the, the, these groups. After two years, they came back to the table, and at the end of two years, they signed the peace treaty. And after 32 years of having the conflict with these guys, we finally reached a period of somewhat peace. But their position was, we always, and this is General William Eaton, who led the first expedition, or Jefferson, had been a diplomat before, and he said, the problem is they consider Americans a weak sect of Christians because we won't fight. And since we won't fight, they're willing to come after us. And so that's why Jefferson said, I'm willing to fight. And, and that's where things turned around. After we showed a willingness to fight, they left us alone. Ladies and gentlemen, David Barton. <laughs> UDTV. The truth lives here.